Washington, D.C., Friday, 29 April, 1961. State Department Auditorium, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. President John F. Kennedy, who had only been in office less than 90 days at this point, meets with the press corps for the first time since the previous day's revelations, which were... Number one, there had been an attempted invasion of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. Number two, the operation had failed spectacularly with 100% of the invaders either killed or captured. And number three, despite President Kennedy's strenuous assertions to the contrary in the previous weeks, when he had insisted that U.S. forces were not planning any sort of hostile action against Cuba, the operation, of course, had been the brainchild of the Department of Defense, and it was carried out by personnel who were trained and equipped by the CIA. But at this press conference, Kennedy didn't take any questions about the Bay of Pigs, at least not until the very end, when he famously remarked that victory has a hundred fathers, but defeat is an orphan. Since the venue was the State Department, and the press conference was ostensibly supposed to be about diplomatic matters, the president opened by saying he would have nothing further to say about the events of the past several days in Cuba beyond the written statement that he had issued on the previous night. And so the bulk of the questions and answers were about U.S.-Soviet relations in general and the space race in particular, because bear in mind this is three weeks after Yuri Gagarin's first orbital flight on Vostok 1 and one week before Al Shepard becomes the first American in space. Now the quote about victory and defeat has gone down in history as being the definitive moment of Kennedy's response to the Bay of Pigs fiasco, but it's the previous day's written statement that I want to focus on for our purposes right now, because it offers such an incredibly stark contrast to the fecklessness and blame-shifting and finger-pointing that we're seeing today from the current president regarding the still-unfolding national embarrassment that's taking place in Afghanistan. Before I read these excerpts, it's instructive to bear in mind that Kennedy would have been perfectly within his rights to blame the whole Bay of Pigs disaster on the previous administration, as Biden, of course, has done with the Afghan disaster, because the Bay of Pigs operation was 100% conceived and financed and planned by Eisenhower's people. So if the 1960 election had gone a slightly different direction, then Nixon would have been the president signing off on this thing and giving it the final go-ahead, and most or all of the Eisenhower people who conceived the thing would have still been in place. But Kennedy had, had no idea such an operation was being planned until he became the president, and the people in his administration knew as little about it as he did. So when the whole thing went tits up and turned into a national humiliation, the instinctive reaction would have been for Kennedy to wash his hands of it and point the finger of blame where it genuinely deserved to be pointed. But he didn't do that. Quoting from the, from the written statement of 28 April, which was addressed to the nation's newspaper editors, and I quote, The president of a great democracy such as ours, and the editors of great newspapers such as yours, owe a common obligation to the people, an obligation to present the facts, to present them with candor, and to present them in perspective. It is with that obligation in mind that I have decided in the last 24 hours to discuss briefly at this time the recent events in Cuba. On that unhappy island, as in so many other areas in the contest for freedom, the news has grown worse instead of better. I have emphasized before that this was a struggle of Cuban patriots against a Cuban dictator. While we could not be expected to lend our sympathies, we made it repeatedly clear that the armed forces of this country would not intervene in any way. It is not the first time that communist tanks have rolled over gallant men and women fighting to redeem the independence of their homeland. Nor is it by any means the final episode in the eternal struggle of liberty against tyranny anywhere on the face of the globe, including Cuba itself. Mr. Castro has said that these were mercenaries. According to press reports, the final message to be relayed from the refugee forces on the beach came from the rebel commander when asked if he wished to be evacuated. His answer was, I will never leave this country. That is not the reply of a mercenary. Meanwhile, 
We will not accept Mr. Castro's attempts to blame this nation for the hatred with which his one-time supporters now regard his repression. But there are from this sobering episode useful lessons for all to learn. Some may be still obscure and wait further information. Some are clear today. First, it is clear that the forces of communism are not to be underestimated in Cuba or anywhere else in the world. The advantages of a police state, its use of mass terror and arrests to prevent the spread of free dissent, cannot be overlooked by those who expect the fall of every fanatic tyrant. Secondly, it is clear that this nation, in concert with all the free nations of this hemisphere, must take an even closer and more realistic look at the menace of external communist intervention and domination in Cuba. The American people are not complacent about iron curtain tanks and planes less than 90 miles from our shores. The evidence is clear, and the hour is late. We and our Latin friends will have to face the fact that we cannot postpone any longer the real issue of the survival of freedom in this hemisphere. The message of Cuba, of Laos, of the rising din of communist voices in Asia and Latin America, these messages are all the same. The complacent, the self-indulgent, the soft societies are about to be swept away with the debris of history. Only the strong, only the industrious, only the determined, only the courageous, only the visionary who determine the real nature of our struggle can possibly survive. End quote. And now I'll quote the, the much more famous passage from the press conference of 29 April. And pay particular attention here to the willingness of a president to be accountable for what happens on his watch, as it is something we are sorely lacking today. Quote, there's an old saying that victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. But I will say to you that I have had, I have said as much as I feel it can be usefully said by me in regard to the events of the past few days. Further statements, detailed discussions are not to conceal responsibility because I am the responsible officer of the government and that is quite obvious, but merely because I do not believe that such a discussion would benefit us during the president di present difficult situation, end quote. Now imagine how silly it would have sounded if he had gone up there and said, Ike did it! It was all Ike! Bald man bad! Bald man bad! Hit the music, Jim Eagle. From high atop the battlements of Castle Curmudgeon, where we can fit 27 illegal aliens into a Volkswagen if you give us enough Vaseline. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America and all ships at sea. Welcome to the program. I am your eponymous host and humble servant. And we need to talk about why the precedent exists in this country that you don't elect longtime senators to the presidency. The aforementioned John F. Kennedy and our good friend Barack Obama those guys were both less than halfway into their first term in the Senate when they were elected to the presidency. And everybody, of course, knew that they were just using the Senate as a stepping stone to the top job. But even still, those are the only two sitting senators ever elected president in the nearly 250-year history of our republic. The only multi-term senator who's ever ascended to the presidency prior to this was Lyndon Johnson who was at the end of his second full term when he successfully extorted JFK into giving him the number two spot on the ticket in 1960. But there was zero possibility of LBJ ever becoming the president except in the manner which he did. He was elected in, in his own right in 1964 only because he knew enough to cloak himself in the mantle of the slain President Kennedy, a man he utterly de detested and couldn't stand to be in the same room with, and to portray himself as the loyal, dutiful torchbearer of the JFK legacy. Joe Biden was a six-term senator. Count him. He was in the Senate three times as long as LBJ was. And as anybody can tell you who's been paying even the slightest attention to his career for the past 50 years since he first arrived in Washington, Joe Biden has never been right about anything. Even his friends and strongest supporters will tell you that. If being wrong about things was the Olympics, Joe Biden would be the bastard love child of Jesse Owens and Michael Phelps. But here's the thing about being a senator. You can be wrong about all the things for decades on end, even to an absurdly comical degree, and you don't ever have to be accountable for it. The proverbial buck never stops with a senator. 
And if you're a guy like Joe Biden, who managed to blunder his way into a Senate seat from one of the country's smallest states at the age of 29, you never have to worry about not being reelected. Because even if you're a bumbling buffoon who loves racial segregation in public schools, which Joe Biden was in 1972, even if you wind up being spectacularly, hilariously wrong about every single question of foreign and domestic policy, which is the one consistent thing about Joe Biden's track record, the people of your tiny state will keep returning you to the Senate for as long as you continue to run, because people in tiny states know better than anybody else who butters their bread. Because much like the British Army of the early 19th century, everything in the Senate is based on seniority. So the longer you remain in the Senate and continue to have a pulse, you get better committee assignments and eventually chairmanships, and the people of your tiny state wind up wielding a wildly disproportionate amount of political power. If you're a state like Delaware, re-electing an in incompetent dumbass senator for the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time rather than replacing him with a smart, talented guy who can actually tell his ass from a hole in the ground makes no sense, because then your little state loses all the outsized power that those committee assignments and chairmanships confer upon it. So there's a perverse incentive for small states to keep re-electing senators who have never been right about anything, who make fools of themselves each time they're in the vicinity of a hot microphone, and whose greatest speeches were plagiarized from minor British socialist MPs of the 1960s. If he's still alive by then, and hasn't been removed from offices under the auspices of the 25th Amendment, Joe Biden will begin his ninth decade on the planet next year. And he never wielded any type of executive power until he became the President of the United States at the age of 78. You wonder why he's flailing around so badly? Why he's so dismally, congenitally unequipped to step up and face the music, to demonstrate any inclination toward taking personal responsibility when his administration screws the pooch as badly as a pooch can be screwed? Why he's unable to do anything but hide out at Camp David while his stultifyingly dull, unexceptional underlings feebly attempt to explain away his own policy failures that have resulted in one of the biggest national humiliations for the United States in the last 100 years? Because it's not difficult to figure out, and plenty of people, yours truly included, gave fair warning that nothing in this man's life experience had prepared him for any sort of leadership role over anything, much less the national government of the most powerful country in the history of the world. If you ask Joe, Ryden, Joe Biden to, to run an Applebee's in Madison, Wisconsin, the results would be just as disastrous. This guy is not good at anything. Even when he was in his prime, he wasn't good at anything, unless being consistently wrong about things counts as a talent. We have devoted $1.2 trillion, over 6,000 American lives, in the service of our 20-year-long misadventure in Afghanistan. And remarkably, the Taliban find themselves in a much stronger position on the day we're leaving than they did on the day we arrived. In October of 2001, the Taliban didn't even control 100% of Afghan territory, maybe two-thirds at best. But today... Well, you bet your sweet ass they control 100% of it. And Joe Biden and the woke Pentagon have made it all the more easy for them to consolidate their power, since they've been nice enough to hand over all of our weapons and vehicles and equipment. And th those guys can hold power for the next 30 years just with all the things we've left behind for them. For Christ's sake, even, even the French are smart enough to know they should take a few moments to spike their cannons and thus deny their use to the enemy before they flee the battlefield in terror, having been routed yet again. But Joe Biden and his woke generals, they are stupider than France. And, you know, it really makes my chest swell with pride, knowing that on the same day the United States was suffering one of the top three humiliations in its entire military history, that across the fruited plain, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines were sitting through woke diversity training classes, writing essays about their white privilege, maybe enjoying a nice drag queen show down at the officers club after work, while the most technologically advanced fighting force in the history of the world 
was seeding the battlefield and fleeing in terror before a bunch of 8th century Afghan tribesmen who have never seen a toilet before. Amazingly, our government doesn't even know how many U.S. nationals are currently trapped in Afghanistan with no way out. Estimates vary anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000. And wouldn't that have been a good thing to know before we just decided to pack up and leave? Aren't we as Americans supposed to never leave our people behind in a hostile foreign theater under any circumstances? Aren't we supposed to be the country that never, ever does crap like that? And so now it's members of Congress who are attempting to do the Biden administration's job for it, trying to cobble together some sort of arrangement whereby these tens of thousands of stranded Americans who have been abandoned to their fate by the president and the Department of Defense and the Department of State can manage somehow to extricate themselves from Afghanistan with their heads still attached to their shoulders because they have not received any assurances from the executive branch except, well, try to get to the airport without getting yourself killed and, and then there might be a slight possibility we, we can get you on an airplane, but no guarantees. You might have to cling to the wheel well. You know how it is. Doesn't a responsible government make sure its civilian citizens have been evacuated before they withdraw their military forces? Doesn't a responsible government retain the use of its most secure military installation until that job is finished? Because who the hell decided it would be a good idea to abandon Bagram Air Base, the one place in the whole of Afghanistan where we could securely conduct operations and tell our people to just take their chances on getting to the airport in Kabul without dying first? You know, the airport that's in a tactically indefensible location where we can't even keep a runway clear long enough to get our planes airborne without some motherfuckers clutching onto the landing gear? If they are this clueless about everything else, I wonder if the people in the Joe Biden administration have any understanding of or appreciation for what is likely to come next. Because it seems now like an inescapable eventuality that hundreds or thousands of U.S. citizens are going to wind up in Taliban captivity. And we know all too well what the Taliban likes to do to its captives. In the best case scenario, if you're an attractive young female, you're going to spend the rest of your life in sexual servitude. Everybody else is probably going to be beheaded or burned alive on live television. It could go on for a period of many months, so huge are the numbers of Americans that Joe Biden has decided to abandon to their fate. And the Taliban? They are a modern technological fighting force now, because of all the weapons and equipment that Joe Biden was nice enough to leave behind for them to use. Hell, there's even a Taliban Air Force now. We have gifted them so much gear why should they limit themselves to operating within the borders of Afghanistan? They can destabilize all of Central Asia now if they feel like it. Start establishing a nice big caliphate just like ISIS did on the watch of the previous Democrat president. But in fairness, Joe Biden has never been anything but a damned fool. If he ever made a right decision or assessed a situation correctly, it would be a marked departure from a half-century-long record of unbroken stupidity and ineptitude. But the generals? What about Mark Milley? What would it take for that ridiculous ass clown to get fired while he was telling Congress that he wants to understand white rage? While he was offering nonsensically feeble excuses for why he put books by Robin D'Angelo and Henry Rogers, sorry, Ibram X. Kendi, on the suggested reading list for army officers? The Taliban were watching laughing their asses off that the U.S. military is being led by such preposterously dumb bastards. They were drinking a toast to how easy it was going to be defeating us and expressing wonderment at all the expensive military equipment they were about to be gifted courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer. When General Milley was being grilled by Tom Cotton about his selection of these vapid critical race theory books for the Army officer's reading list, and you may have seen the video, you could tell exactly the kind of low-information, guilty, white liberal this guy is. Because I'll let you guys in on a secret. Those Robin D'Angelo, Ibram X. Kendi books, the people who buy those books, they don't read them. 
They buy them so they can place them in prominent locations on their home bookshelves in the hopes that their dinner guests will notice and think, wow, this guy is reading all the right books. I really like the cut of his jib. Now, no currently serving U.S. general or admiral has ever won a war. And when you listen to an idiot like Mark Milley, when you hear him justifying race hatred trash literature by saying things like, well, these are theories that out there and I want our officers to be well read. It starts making sense how the most technologically sophisticated fighting force in the history of armed conflict could wind up being defeated by a bunch of cavemen whose lifestyles haven't advanced to any appreciable degree since around the year 800 AD. But yeah, please, let's keep electing presidents based on seniority. And let's keep entrusting our military leadership to people who think understanding white rage and purging the ranks of all non-wokesters is more important than defeating our enemies and hearing the lamentations of their women. Because what the hell could go wrong? Thanks for watching. See you Friday. Get off my burqa.